1. Introduction In this essay I wish to argue that the Dead Sea Scrolls provide modern scholarship with a very significant opportunity for the mutual illumination of both artifact and method, so that the manuscripts and the contents provoke the refinement of modern reading strategies, and those strategies, once refined and adjusted, serve all the better to assist in the understanding of the manuscripts themselves. Nowhere else in the Mediterranean basin has there been such a remarkable discovery of turn-of-the-era manuscripts, nearly all of whose provenance is known, together with at least one archaeological site largely undisturbed since antiquity. It should be possible to think not only that now is the time for the application of various modern approaches to the evidence for its better understanding, but also that such distinctive evidence should enable new light to be thrown on the methods themselves because of the concentration of the evidence in time and place and the many opportunities for analysis that such concentration permits. On that basis, this contribution is concerned to show that a suitable understanding of the so-called biblical manuscripts found in the eleven caves at Ani Qumran does much to dissolve the supposed distinction between higher and lower criticism that has long been maintained in biblical studies, it is no longer suitable for one set of experts to think of themselves as taking the high road, while others take the low road. One even as late as 1966 Fortress Press considered it worthwhile to republish the second edition of Davith R. App Thomas's small primer of Old Testament text criticism. 2. John Reumann provided a preface in which he noted that 1. To play on the opening lines of the anonymous refrain of the Bonnie Banks O Loch Loman, O Y E L L Tack the High Road, and I'll Tack the Low Road, and I'll be in Scotland afore ye. 2. D. R. App Thomas, A Primer of Old Testament Text Criticism, Facet Books 14, Philadelphia, Fortress, 1966. The first edition was published in 1947, London, Epworth, before Minus One. 2. Reading the Dead Sea Scrolls The recovery of ancient Hebrew manuscripts from caves at Qumran and neighboring areas of the Judean Desert in both Jordan and Israel had changed the textual landscape so that even for laymen and pastors who know no Hebrew, the finds from the Dead Sea region have focused attention on the text and on the need for possible revisions in our English translations. 3. However, Ab Thomas's revised primer contained no references to the Dead Sea Scrolls, as if they were considered unlikely to alter the life of the text critic other than by providing many new examples that could be fitted into the well-worn methodologies already established. The reluctance of critical scholarship to acknowledge that the so-called biblical scrolls require a fresh consideration of the canons of text criticism is a further demonstration, if any was needed, that Qumran scholarship has reached only the toddler stage, as are. Timothy McClay has recently noted, though he also hopes that, it will no doubt be influential in the years to come. 4. In a caricatured form, low criticism has been concerned over several generations with attempting to establish the original text, your text, of each biblical book. Though this is often acknowledged as a difficult task, nevertheless text critics have set out on the quest along the low road with various assumptions, many of which have been firmly based in the Enlightenment in its Reformation and Renaissance roots, such as that the more ancient reading should be sought and preferred over against any attempt at understanding a received text in its own right. Perhaps chief among the assumptions of those involved with lower criticism has been that the quest has indeed to do precisely with the establishing of the original text. All evidence is considered with such an end in mind. So Paul Maas for one has written that, the business of textual criticism is to produce a text as close as possible to the original, 5 echoing John P. Postgate's earlier comment that, the aim of the textual critic may then be defined as the restoration of the text, as far as possible, to its original form, if by original form, we understand the form intended by the author. 6. The most recent extensive volume of text criticism for the Hebrew Bible by Emmanuel Tov has endorsed this approach though. The Dead Sea Scrolls were known. The second edition was first published in Britain in 1965, Oxford, Basil Blackwell. 3. J. Reumann, Introduction, in Ap Thomas, Primer of Old Testament Text Criticism. E. 4. R. T. McClay, The Use of the Septuagint in New Testament Research, Grand Rapids, Edmonds, 2003, she. McClay's book is a plea for New Testament scholars, partly stimulated by the finds of Greek scriptural manuscripts in the Qumran caves, to take far more interest in the Septuagint than is generally the case. 5. P. Mass, Textual Criticism, Trans. B. Flower, Oxford, Clarendon, 1958, 1. 6. J. P. 
Postgate, Textual Criticism, in Encyclopedia Britannica, 14, 708-15, here 709. Both Mars and Postgate are cited in E. Top Textual Criticism of the Hebrew Bible, 2nd Rev. Ed. Assen, Van Gorkum, Minneapolis, Fortress, 2001, 288. Higher and Lower Criticism 3. With some qualification, it would seem preferable to aim at the one text or different texts which was, were, accepted as authoritative in, and earlier periods. 7. The inappropriate differentiation between higher and lower criticism has indeed been recognized, but not widely. Tov, a current leading authority on the textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible and its versions, has himself recognized what is at stake. In his authoritative 1992 article on textual criticism, eight, he has commented both that the designation, low criticism, is wrong, and that t, he biblical books each developed to the stage at which they were considered finished literary products, and textual criticism concerns itself with charting developments from that point on. The reconstruction of all developments prior to that point is the concern of literary criticism. However, since some form of written transmission must have occurred during the stage of literary growth, sharp distinctions between the two cannot always be drawn. 9. Tov provides somewhat more coverage of these points in his major handbook on textual criticism of the same date. 10. Importantly, the major difference between that edition and the second revised edition, 2001, is the adjustment of several of the pages allocated for the discussion of the interdependence of literary and textual approaches. 11. The major corollary of the search for the original text has been the assumption that scribes are technical copyists and that the vast majority of variants in the surviving manuscript evidence are somehow the results of errors and misunderstandings.